All right, good afternoon. Uh, this is a regularly scheduled meeting of the um, Public Safety, Civil Rights and Emergency Management uh, Committee. Uh, my name is Guang Yang. I'm the chair of this committee. And with me today are Council Members Reich, Gordon, and Quincy. And we are a quorum of this committee. Uh, we have two absences, uh, Council Member Palmasano and Council Member or Council President uh, Johnson. Uh, both are, um, I believe one is sick and one is on city business or something like that. So uh, we will continue this meeting as uh, planned. Uh, today we have a number of items, um, 12 items on our agenda. And this is actually a pretty full agenda relative to other uh, agendas that we've had in the past. Um, and uh, we have two public hearings. Uh, we have a number of consent items. We have a receive and file item, and we have a discussion item. And um, I will take care of the consent and receive and file items, and then we will save the discussion items for last, and we will do the public hearing in, right in the middle there. So uh, for the consent items, uh, number three is accepting a Minnesota Board of Firefighter Training and Education um, funding under the round eight training reimbursement program in the amount of $66,720 for training conducted between uh, July 1st, uh, 2015 and June 30th, 2016. Uh, the next item is authorizing an ongoing memo of understanding to have the Minneapolis PD extend its services beyond its jurisdictions for the purpose of providing mutual aid in the form of special weapons and tactics, emergency tactical response to the University of Minnesota Police Department. And the next item is a revenue contract with the University of Minnesota for security services at TCF Stadium for a Vikings playoff game on January 10th, 2016, which happened already. Um, the next item after that is a revenue contract between the Minneapolis uh, Public Housing Authority and the City of Minneapolis, or the MPD, to provide security services, uh, revenue agreement uh, for up to 25 the next item is a contract for patrol, uh, which is the peace officer accredited training online with the League of Minnesota Cities for reg registration costs and a contract that is worth up to $76,190. Uh, and the, the last consent item is a contract amendment with the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine Center for Police Canine Care. And that is a contract amount that would be up to about $42,595. So um, council members, for those um, items for consent, any questions, anyone want to pull it off for a discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion carries. Uh, the next item is a contract compliance division 2015 fourth quarter report and annual summary. And this is receiving and filing the contract compliance division 2015 fourth quarter report and annual summary. Um, you know, if you get a chance, please uh, review them. Uh, but other than that, um, any discussion on this? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the motion carries. All right, now we are going to get to our public hearings. And the first of our public hearings is with regards to the small and underutilized business enterprise program extension ordinance. And this is the passage of an ordinance amending Title 16, Chapter 423 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances uh, related to planning and development small and underutilized business enterprise program, amending the sunset date of the small and underutilized business enterprise program. And uh, I hope in that uh, Karen Francois is here and she's gonna do a short presentation and then we will open up the public hearing. Thank you and good afternoon, Mr. Chair. And uh, committee members, my name is Karen Francois, and I'm the director of the Contract Compliance Division. And as you said, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm here today to request an amendment to Title 16, Chapter 423, Section 160 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances, amending the sunset date of the Small and Underutilized Business Program, also known as the SUBP, from April 1st, 2016 to December 31st, 2018. The purpose of the SUBP is to remedy past and ongoing discrimination against women owned and minority owned business enterprises found in the city's marketplace. 
In order to withstand the scrutiny of the courts, race and gender conscious programs like the SUVP require sound statistical evidence that discrimination does in fact exist. The city's SUBP is based on this type of evidence that was most recently compiled in a disparity study that was conducted for the city and concluded in 2010. A new disparity study will begin this year and is scheduled for completion in mid-2017. My request is that the program be extended to allow time to understand and accept the new disparity study and its recommendations, and if necessary, to revise the program ordinance based on the new data. And we'd like to be able to do that all without causing an interruption to the program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. So uh, this public hearing uh, will proceed as follows. Uh, we have a sign-up sheet that is with the clerk. Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody has signed up for that. Um, I have a sign-in sheet where uh, I have two people signed up for the public hearing and I'm wondering, um, Mr. Rickmeyer and uh, Ms. Uh, Broadhag, um, you're both here for the other public hearing, is that correct? Mr. Yes, okay, all right. So I, I will just go through uh, what we're gonna do and then we'll just open it up and we'll just kind of go after that. Uh, so we have sign-up sheets. Um, and, you know, uh, Ms. Francois has done the briefing of the proposed ordinance already. Um, I will open up the public hearing. Each speaker will uh, be given about three minutes, and uh, we will continue until all speakers are allowed time to address the committee. Uh, please state your name and your address for the record and your organization if you represent one and whether you support or oppose uh, the ordinance. Um, and written comments can be submitted to the clerk. Um, and that's kind of where we're at. So uh, for the first item, which is a small and underutilized business enterprise program extension ordinance, um, I will open up the public hearing. All right, anybody here for uh, the public hearing on that? All right, going once, going twice, we will close the public hearing. All right, council members, any anyone have any questions with regards to this matter? No questions whatsoever? All right, so at this point, we just will vote on um, recommendation on this. And so I will move to recommend um, approval of item number one. Um, any discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion carries. Thank you. All right, the second item, and uh, the item before us is the repeal of prohibitions about congregating on streets or sidewalks ordinance, and this is passage of an ordinance amending Title 17, Chapter 423 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances related to streets and sidewalks in general repealing Section 4, uh, 27.220 entitled Congregating on Streets or Sidewalks. And um, with regards to that, um, we have an RCA, it's a relatively simple one. Uh, I didn't know if anybody from the MPD or um, the City Attorney's Office wanted to speak a little bit about that, but if not, we can just uh, proceed um, and so if you can just allow me just a second to get started on this all right so I'm, I'm gonna read just a little bit of the background just uh, for all of us uh, this is this is an ordinance uh, repeal that is being proposed by council uh, Vice President Glidden and myself with regards to um, this matter. And it's basically under uh, Minneapolis Ordinance uh, 427.220. It's a misdemeanor offense for three or more people to stand together or near each other in any street or on any footwalk or sidewalk as to obstruct the free passage for pedestrians. Uh, this, the ordinance requires these persons to move immediately at the request of the mayor chief of police or any police officer. And this ordinance has only been occasionally charged in criminal cases in recent years. And I will reserve my comments for um, after the public hearing, but um, this is kind of where, um, I, I, just to me, it just seems very clear that uh, we, we probably should repeal this. But um, 
I will uh, get to the public hearing and uh, we have two people signed up for the pu public hearing at this point and uh, I will uh, open up the public hearing at this point. So I'm gonna start with um, Mr. Rickmeyer, Peter Rickmeyer. You have three minutes. Good afternoon and thank you. I, I'm not in support of repealing this uh, ordinance. The, the reason is, is that the proposal of repealing it comes from the bad behaviors of a very small percentage of Minneapolis police officers. The problem is that the Minneapolis Police Union is so strong, it does not allow the mayor, city council, or the police chief to recommend and have police officers fired for discriminatory acts, unless of course they're drunk and they make derogatory remarks about the chief of police, then the officers are fired. The, the law is intended to stop people from hanging out at the little convenience stores, gas stations, dealing drugs, stalking people and robbing them at gunpoint. Uh, one particular incident which I became involved in happened on December 21st of 2015. Uh, a lady uh, went it's a little gas station on James and West Broadway. I think it's Amstar. And uh, when she came out, the three or four people that always hang out there had guns with them, followed her a couple blocks. And then when, as she was being robbed, a disabled person interceded on her behalf, and he got beat up. the cops, and, and I did talk to the manager of the store, uh, he said that there's videotape of the kids hanging out there and that indeed he had called many times on these individuals and the cops won't come and at least tell them to leave. Um, so, so what happened is that about an hour and a half later, I'm walking down Broadway and I run into this distraught lady alone on Broadway. And I asked her what the problem is. She explained to me that the cops came, told her that there was nothing they could do because they wouldn't be able to catch the kids. Mr. Rickmeyer, if you can wrap up. And I explained to the victim that the store had cameras that had video of the kids that had robbed her. And I walked her back down to the gas station where she confirmed it with the manager of the store. I did advise the victim that the next time she gets robbed to make sure you get robbed in the suburb because the cops respond quicker. I got one last note. I understand one or two of the council members support and encourage Black Lives Matter and- Ms. Mr. Rickmeyer, uh, I'm gonna cut you off here. Um, I want you to be germane to what our public hearing is today. Your comments have to be germane to this. And so if you um, have anything related to this congregating the sidewalks, please, but if not, I'm gonna cut you off. The, I would like to leave with this last comment. Uh, Camden, New Jersey, dismantled their police department to, group to get rid of the police union, formed a new police department called City Police. And now their police department has very few just racist complaints against the cops in Camden, New Jersey. I would ask this committee to contact the leadership in Camden, New Jersey, and get all the information that they have that might be helpful in determining how to stop the discriminatory acts between a few Minneapolis police officers 
in the black community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Amanda Brodhagen. Good afternoon, my name is Amanda Brodhag. Um, I'm a certified student attorney with the University of St. Thomas School of Law <clears throat> with the Community Justice Project, which is a legal rights um, clinic. I have been on the team to research low-level ordinances such, such as these, and in the past several semesters, we've worked alongside the City Council in repealing some of those. Um, when representatives from the Department of Justice came and spoke to community members last fall, they discussed with us their support of the continuance of repealing these low-level ordinances. Um, so with that said, I support this repeal. Um, this ordinance is overly broad from a legal standpoint. It allows huge unchecked discretion for officers um, to stop people on the sidewalk if they're congregated with two or more people. They don't have to know them. There's no specific conduct that is having to be alleged. Um, there are other ordinances to cover robbery or lurking, or excuse me, not lurking anymore, but loitering, um, things like this, that the officers will still have these tools and abilities to stop crime from happening, but congregating on the sidewalk and talking with two friends while waiting for a bus is not criminal, and we should not be, um, be criminalizing people for just standing um, because they're waiting for the bus. And this ordinance and low-level ordinances such as these need to continue to be repealed because they disproportionately affect communities of color and low-income communities. Um, and I would recommend um, City Council as a whole read the ACLU report picking up the pieces to kind of show some of this, some of this disparity. Um, I look forward to the City Council's continued efforts to repeal these low-level ordinances, and I want to thank um, both you, Council Member Yang, and um, Vice President Wooden for um, co-authoring this bill. Um, to repeal this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's the end of my sign-up sheet. Um, are there any other folks who want to speak? Uh, Ms. Gross, come on, step on up. Good afternoon, um, council members. My name is Michelle Gross, and I'm president of the organization Communities United Against Police Brutality. Our organization stands firm in um, um, support of repealing this ordinance because it uh, as uh, a previous speaker mentioned, uh, disproportionately affects people of color. It criminalizes conduct that people um, engage in routinely as part of their daily affairs, such as waiting for buses. And it criminalizes conduct of people who are just standing in a space that happens to be populated by other people. Again, bus stops, you know, common areas like that. Um, it's uh, it, the, the conduct is vague. The conduct is not criminal conduct by any means. There are other ordinances to address um, and state laws to address the issues that the, one of the prior speakers raised about robberies and other bad conduct by people. Just merely standing in a public space should not um, expose you to a uh, criminal charge. And so for that reason, our organization stands firm in, um, you know, asking that this ordinance be repealed and supporting the efforts to do so. And we thank the uh, members of the council who support this. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other folks here who uh, want to speak on this issue? All right, going once, twice. All right, I will close this public hearing. In council members, anyone with any comments or anyone want to add anything to this before we um, make a recommendation? Council member Gordon. Well, I'm happy to move it forward, although you could do that too. I just wanted to Please. speak in favor of, 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 of this and highlight a couple of things that I found interesting in my research. I just wanted to be clear with, with others um, that, that we will still have plenty of uh, opportunity and laws to rely on to, um, I think, address any concerns that were brought up today or might be brought up in the future. <clears throat> we have um, one uh, ordinance that's entitled Obstructing Pedestrian and Vehicular Traffic, um, 466.240, that will um, allow uh, police to deal with anybody who's blocking uh, anybody with anything or themselves or a group of themselves. Um, we also have uh, another ordinance um, 385.65, which is called interference with pedestrian or vehicular traffic. I guess interference and obstruction are two slightly different things. So we, or councils before us, decided we needed two different ordinances about that though. But that also um, relates to this and makes it really clear that um, somebody can't uh, 
walk, stand, sit, lie, or place an object in such a manner as to block passage by another person or a vehicle, um, or to require another person or a driver of a vehicle to take evasive action to avoid physical contact. I mentioned both of these um, ordinances, one, to reassure people that we'll have all the other all tools still in place to deal with these issues, and two, to highlight that, well, maybe there's also some other ordinances that are so wide open for discretionary use and so vague that we could end up um, not, you know, we we'll still have some work to do to really solve the problems in the end. But um, uh, and then there's um, there's other ordinances that also could likely be tools to deal with this too. But I just wanted to highlight those most clearly, especially for those people who are concerned. We now would have no way of dealing with um, a person or a group of people who are blocking the sidewalk. We certainly would. Thank you, Council Members. Anyone else? If not, I'm, I'm going to add my uh, two cents to this. Um, now, with regards to this uh, congregating on sidewalks ordinance, um, my office and count, council vice president's office um, asked MPD and the city attorney's office for some statistics as to you know what um, what was happening. And you know, in the last five years, we got stats from MPD and uh, the city attorney's office. Uh, the numbers were a little bit irregular in the sense that you know with MPD, they said that you know, in the past uh, five years there were about three arrests. Uh, related to uh, this specific ordinance uh, with the city attorney's office. It was about 30 uh, being charged and were convicted or a number of different things. And so, you know, just those numbers, uh, three to 30 relative to just the number of um, prosecutions or arrests that happened per year for the last five years, if you multiply that, I mean, are just speaks to just kind of the three and 30 being very minuscule relative to everything else. And you know, I wanted to ask our city attorney who's staffing us today just to kind of give us a perspective as to the three and 30 that uh, is out there. I mean, relative to you know what you your office deals with, the volume and all that stuff, I mean, how does that compare? I think you said it best, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, considering the thousands and thousands of prosecutions our office handles every year, um, the difference between three cases and 30 cases is statistically uh, insignificant. And, you know, it's a, not, a, not a large piece of business for either the MPD or the city attorney's office. Thank you. Um, you know, so that's, that's one portion of it. I, the other thing is, you know, um, I, I think it was last year, the Star Tribune took a really uh, cool picture of, um, of um, the mayor, of um, the Secretary of HUD, uh, Julian Castro, of um, Congressman Keith Ellison and myself, in which we're all congregating on the sidewalk for, for a little while. And so if you're using this definition, I mean, it just screams of just, there's a problem here. Uh, the third uh, piece I wanna just throw out there is, you know, I, I think, I mean, Council Vice President Glenn and myself, I mean, look at this, you know, let's say from um, our our hats as lawyers, and I, I think you know it just screams of First Amendment violations. Uh, just screams of it, and you know with regards to that, I mean I would just you know uh, ask my colleagues to support this repeal. Um, you know I, I you know kind of like what Councilmember uh, Gordon has uh, spoken to. You know there may be a number of different um, low level um, ordinances uh, that you know could deserve some attention, but I mean, for me right now, I'm just focused on this one. And I just think that it would be, you know, um, a good thing for our city to repeal this uh, specific ordinance. Uh, Council Member Gordon. I just wanted to respond slightly in defense of those other ordinances that I cited. There's actually a, a, a interesting distinction between those two ordinances and the one we're repealing today. Both of those ordinances stipulate in there something to the effect of, and one of them exactly this language, acts authorized as an exercise of one's constitutional rights of freedom of speech and assembly, and acts authorized by permit, et cetera, et cetera, um, shall not constitute a violation of this ordinance. Um, so unlike the congregating one, which leaves that out, those other two actually expressly provide a provision in there to protect those constitutional rights. So I think that's a strength of those other two. Right, and before we, Keep on going with this. Um, I just want to acknowledge that Council Vice President Glidden is in the audience here, and I didn't get a sense from you whether you wanted to respond. Perfect. All right. Uh, Council members, any other um, questions, discussion, anything like that? Uh, so I will move to recommend um, approval of this item for repeal. Uh, any discussion? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
right, the motion carries. Thank you. And with that, we are done with our public hearings. And uh, we will move to item number 10, which is the body worn camera implementation directive. And this is receiving a report to engage the community in developing the proposed body worn camera policy. And with this, uh, um, DC Arandondo, you're up, right? Yep. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Yang, members of the committee. Uh, myself and Christina Kendricks from our uh, enterprise uh, uh, NCR are here today to uh, provide a report uh, to our committee members regarding the staff directive for us to, um, uh, we're focused on looking at what, once the uh, preliminary body camera draft policy uh, was presented, we wanted to look at uh, how we would best utilize uh, our other folks, including NCR, but also most importantly, uh, our police conduct oversight commission in terms of what a structured community engagement plan uh, would look like. So with that, we'd like to uh, present that for uh, our committee members today. Do we have a slotted? There. Council Chair Yang and council members, thank you so much for giving an opportunity for us to um, present our body camera community engagement plan. Um, I'll start off with a little bit of the background, um, which gives the history. Um, MPD did conduct a body camera pilot, and during that pilot, I believe it was conducted last year, they used what they call the standard operating procedure guideline. And the Police Conduct Oversight Commission, the PCOC, after that pilot program did conduct three community engagement sessions. Um, with those community uh, forums, they also did their own extensive research and looking at best practices, et cetera, across the country. And with that, they did provide, along with the input from the community engagement sessions that they conducted, their recommendations um, on how to move forward with the body camera um, draft policy. So the purpose of this next community engagement session is going to continue engagement efforts, um, take the draft back to the community, get input and continue the dialogue and receive feedback on the body camera draft policy. The policy was released and is now accessible to the public In conducting these engagement efforts, we've identified several partners, um, naturally the MPD. Uh, the PCOC has been in uh, continuous dialogue with um, MPD on what their role may be. They're actually going to be meeting tomorrow on this, and we'll have a better definition of what their role is going to be in the engagement effort for the draft of the policy. Um, we're also gonna be reaching out to several community-based organizations uh, in leadership in you know, formal and informal groups to bring them to the table to ensure that we are reaching as much of our community as we possibly can. The messaging that we'll be taking out, of course, is not only the draft of the policy, but um, most importantly, it'll also give some background on the PCOC and what their role has been. And um, it's also a great way to introduce, introduce that um, commission to the community. Um, I think there's a lot of community, especially our cultural communities and non-English speaking communities who don't uh, have a, a level of awareness that the PCOC and what their role is. Ms. Ms. Um, Hendricks, um, Council Member Quincy has a question. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you were just uh, concluding your last remarks with one of my questions was how we were going to be addressing uh, uh, cultural uh, communities, especially when languages are one thing. So I'm pleased to hear that response embedded in that. Um, and, and if you'd like to elaborate on that, you could. But I also had a question about uh, business associations, as I consider that kind of a stakeholder group, especially when you're talking about mm -hmm. in various parts of the city, all over uh, business associations and their relationships. Uh, with patrol officers can be a, a big deal. So I wondered if, if they were included in your stakeholder groups 
as your part of your outreach group? Um, Councilmember Quincy, thank you. Yes, they are. And as we move through the presentation, I'll get a lot more into uh, detail on specific communities that we're going to do very targeted outreach to, as well as broader <coughs> reach um, for some general public general sessions. Uh, this is going to be a pretty robust plan with a very quick turnaround. So um, I also do have some timelines listed. Um, uh, so yes, along with the messaging, we will have uh, for sure identified key points. Uh, as I mentioned before, the community will have full access to the draft of the policy, but we certainly want to pull out some of the things that we are pretty confident the community really wants to know about, such as when the cameras will be turned on, when they won't be, et cetera. Um, so we have broken our community engagement sessions um, and the partners that we feel that will lead as well as connect with. Uh, specifically, we want to do uh, the utmost due diligence in reaching our cultural non-English speaking communities. These are a list of the communities that we hope to tap into, um, along with key organizations that we are hoping will agree to host these sessions. Um, by no means are they the only list of who we will be reaching out. There's a whole host of community and culturally specific organizations that the Access and Outreach team in the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department have very, very strong relationships with. So we will be bringing them on board to um, send the message out, um, ensure that their community understands that uh, these meetings will be conducted, that we're looking for this input, and um, the times, days, times, et cetera. So as I stated before, PCOC is going to be meeting um, and talking about it, uh, what their role may be in the community engagement plan. Whether um, the PCOC is the lead on scheduling our public, uh, our open public sessions, and, and I do want to mention that all of these sessions are public, open to the, all the public, 